welcome to Daily Debrief brought to you by People's Dispatch where we bring you top stories from around the globe. I'm Shriya and in today's episode we talk about the political upheaval in Peru which has been seeing weeks of protests and a brutal repression from the Dina Boluarte government. We also talk about the latest from on and off the court at this year's Australian Open which concluded on January 29 in Melbourne. And finally, the International Criminal Court has decided to resume investigation in Philippines' controversial war on drugs. In Peru's capital, Lima, massive mobilizations are occurring almost daily, demanding the resignation of de facto President Dina Boluarte and her regime. The pro-democracy protests have gathered support from far and wide, while Boluarte's government has resorted to brutal suppression of the protesters by deploying about 10,000 police and military officers just in Lima. 50 days of social protests in Peru since December 7 have resulted in deaths of around 60 people, seven of whom were minors. We're joined by Zoe from People's Dispatch with latest updates on the situation in Peru. Hi Zoe, welcome to this episode. So Zoe, uh, in Lima, the protests have been going on for weeks now, nearly 50 days, uh, and uh, the repression has been matched with the scale of the protests. What is the latest that's happening there? Well, as we've been following on People's Dispatch uh, the past several weeks, large delegations have been arriving to Lima from the countryside, uh, from the provinces where there had been very, very intense repression and uh, road blockades. Um, and protesters felt that it was important to bring this message to the seat of the government, uh, to the capital city, to make sure that their demands were heard and that uh, such horrific repression couldn't uh would be less likely to take place if it were in the capital. Um, so they've been mobilizing in large numbers, both people from the countryside and uh, workers, students from uh, Lima itself. And this past weekend, there was another large mobilization on Saturday. Um, and we saw, you know, a lot of the regional delegations performing traditional dances, singing songs, a large, large, large mobilization. And then uh, once it started getting a little dark, there were confrontations between protesters and police and police began to heavily repress these protests. And uh, there's already uh, videos that have been circulating on social media of showing police kind of just indiscriminately firing tear gas canisters, pellet guns at protesters' bodies, at their heads, at their chests. Um, and this very uh, intense escalation of repression has already cost uh, one live, a 55-year-old man, uh, Victor Yaksalvika, um, he was pronounced dead on Saturday night. He was hit in the head with a pellet gun. Um, he bled out on the sidewalk and was immediately rushed to the emergency room, but he uh, did die from these wounds. Uh, many others were gravely injured. Pro uh, journalists uh, were attacked while they were actually filming some of this. One journalist was arrested. So there was a whole slew of uh, violations of, of protesters' rights, of people's civil rights, human rights that happened on Saturday. Very, very brutal, very shocking. Uh, but we've seen a very similar response, unfortunately, from Peruvian mainstream media um, who have said that it was other protesters that um, had attacked these people and that that's why this person died. Some people have said that it was a rock that hit his head. So there's, again, this dispute of the narrative. But I think... Uh, above all, because of the documentation that there's been uh, be from independent media, uh, it's it's pretty clear what happened. Um, and people are determined to continue protesting, to continue raising the demand that Dina Boluarte should resign, that there be immediate elections. And actually today itself, there is going to be a vote on that. Right, Zoe. And like you said, a major demand is the resignation of Dina Boluarte. What the people of Peru have received so far from the government's end is just rep repression. So, what do you think and when do you think uh, this demand will be fulfilled? Well, it's interesting because a lot of people have been looking at uh, prior examples of when, pe uh, when people have been demanding the resignation of presidents. And we can look at 2020 um, when Merino was uh, voted out in impeachment motion. Uh, he was an interim president as well. And after two people were killed in protests demanding his resignation, uh, he actually resigned. And um, there began a process of, uh, of transitional government, etc. Um, and so people have been demanding this for over a month. And uh, it's interesting because there's been already 60 people killed 
horrific acts of violence against the population, uh, but really Dina Bonduarte shows no evidence, no signs of uh, being willing to step down. In fact, she's reiterated time and time again that she will not step down. And she does have the support of the army, of the police. Uh, the right wing has really united behind her. And I think that she's kind of uh, locked in as the, with them as their allies, even though, of course, she did originally come from a left wing party. Um, that being said, uh, she is also pressuring for elections to be held this year. Uh, however, on the street, people are demanding early elections and her resignation. They don't think she can uh, actually last a day longer after all of the crimes that she's committed against the Peruvian people. However, as I said, because she does have the backing of the major branches of power, it seems unlikely that she would resign unless for some reason uh, they uh, split behind her, she loses some of their support, or some other major uh, change happens in terms of their support for her. Um, so that's that's what we can see happening. She's made reiterated um, addresses to the nation, continuing to criminalize protesters, continuing to say that everything that the police is doing is immaculate, uh, that there's really that they're responding to violence from the protesters, um, and really just disparaging a lot of the demands and a lot of what's happening on the streets with the majority of the population. And it's important to point out as well that she. Both she and the Congress have extremely low approval ratings. Um, the majority of the Peruvian people do not want her there. They do not want this Congress. Um, and that's why they're demanding such structural and sweeping political changes in the country. Thank you so much for bringing this very important update, Zoe. We'll see you uh, as we follow the story very closely again. Thanks so much for having me. The year's first tennis Grand Slam concluded in Melbourne on Sunday with the men's singles final where Novak Djokovic told the world he's still very much up there with the best in the world and has plenty of tennis left in him. In beating Stefano Sissipas in straight sets, he equaled Rafael Nadal's 22 Grand Slam singles titles and is on course to make the record his own. Sidhan joins us now to talk about Djokovic and the women's side of the tournament which concluded a day previously. Welcome to this episode, Sidhan. So, Novak Djokovic's uh, 10th Australian Open and 22nd Grand Slam, like you said, he's set to make a record which is, well, going to be historic. Do you have any comments about his trajectory as a player so far? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's, uh, if there's anything, uh, Sriya, that Novak Djokovic is, uh, it's not short on talking points. Uh, you know, through his career, the way he is sort of evolved, coming, of, of course, uh, starting uh, in a situation where, like, like at a time when uh, that part of the world where he comes from, Serbia, uh, was war torn, and, and despite all of the hardship that he and his family had to face, uh, still reached the highest levels of men's professional tennis. Uh, started off as an upstart, really. Uh, you know, by, by then, the rivalry between uh, Rafael Nadal and Roger Federer was already in full swing. And as far as most of the tennis world was concerned, at least those looking at men's tennis, that was the main rivalry that was going to grab headlines for the next decade or so to come. But Djokovic wasn't having any of it. Uh, and uh, since then, he has consistently shown that he, he's up there among uh, the greatest who have played the game, uh, whether uh, men or women. And, and, and like you pointed out, 22 Grand Slam titles now and still, uh, like he showed yesterday, he was playing against Stefanos Tsitsipas, uh, who was uh, born in 1998, uh, so 20, 25 uh, years or so old, uh, at least 10 years junior to Novak Djokovic. Uh, and Djokovic showing that uh, plenty of uh, you know gas still in the tank uh, to keep that uh, keep keep it going and and uh, surpass perhaps Nadal. Nadal Federer, of course, is done with the game. Uh, and uh, Rafael Nadal is still around, but we, we don't. I don't think we will see him uh, at uh, the, the later stages of a Grand Slam, uh, given all the injuries that he's gone through and the condition that his body seems to be in. So uh, for Novak Djokovic, the chance now to finally take that uh, number one spot as far as the men's Grand Slam titles are concerned, and and really establish himself in the narrative as one of, uh, like I was saying, uh, the best to ever play the game. Uh, also, what they've done, uh, Shriya, is to like revolutionize the the, the game as, as a whole. 
Right, Sudhant. And on 29 January, the women's tournament also came to an end. It's been an interesting game for the female players. And a notable Asian player, Sanya Mirza, she also announced an exit of sorts. That's eventual. Uh, so, anything on that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, unfortunately, we don't do the show on Sunday, so we couldn't really uh, talk about the women's final. But but there again, uh, the impact of the likes of Serena Williams, who uh, in many books is the actual goat as far as uh, singles tennis is concerned. Uh, the kind of impact that Serena has had and, and Venus Williams, her elder sister before her, uh, the kind of impact they've had on the women's game uh, showed in the finals. Both the finalists, uh, Sabalenka from Belarus uh, and uh, Ribakina, uh, were playing, you know, very high risk uh, tennis, uh, going for the big shots, going for the touchline, and often hitting it. Uh, extremely entertaining game of tennis again. And uh, in a way, what also makes it interesting is the backdrop to all this. Uh, at Wimbledon, uh, Belarusian and, and Russian athletes have been banned from competing in the hopes of perhaps avoiding this kind of a situation. And exactly that has happened. Uh, an athlete from Belarus, everyone knows she's from Belarus, has gone and won the title. Uh, and of course, the backdrop of uh, the Russia-Ukraine uh, war remains. Uh, there is a, a push happening alongside to include Russian and Belarusian athletes in Asian competitions because of the stance that Europe has taken uh, Against it, and we, we might uh, actually talk about that a bit more on the show uh, tomorrow or later in the week. Uh, but for Ribakina, uh, uh, sorry, for Sabalanka, uh, an extremely important uh, victory, of course, winning a Grand Slam is a, is a huge, uh, huge thing. Uh, but it also demonstrates how widely the women's game has actually proliferated. If you look at uh, the, the winners of Grand Slams over the past um, maybe two, three years, You'll find a number of new countries coming into the fold where, uh, from where athletes have been able to uh, push on and go to the not just final rounds, but actually win tournaments. Uh, unfortunately, like you were mentioning, uh, Sanya Mirza, who is uh, India's probably tennis superstar uh, of all time, men or women included, despite the fact that we've had the likes of Mahesh Bhupati and Leander Pace, who've gone on to be world number one in, in the doubles game. Uh, she called time on her career in Grand Slams uh, with a final loss. Uh, she played alongside Rohan Bopanna, uh, another Indian. Uh, they unfortunately didn't win the final. Uh, but 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 Sanya Mirza has proved to be uh, a massive icon for, I think, women's sport uh, in India and in, in South Asia and all of these parts of the world. Uh, she was saying in interviews over the past week how... Uh, very much, and she's of course married to a famous cricketer from Pakistan, Shoaib Malik. So, so how, uh, because the South Asian diaspora is, is so is spread out so far and wide, uh, the, the kind of fame and the kind of uh, iconic status that she achieved uh, perhaps doesn't measure up to uh, the kind of success that she had on the tennis court. As a singles player, we remember her. She was the first uh, from India to reach the third round of a Grand Slam singles uh, back in 2005 when she played against Serena Williams. And, and you know, she she sort of flashed back to that time 18 years ago uh, when Serena told her, you know, keep fighting. And that's exactly what she's done. She stood for what she's believed in. Uh, she stood for what she is. Uh, and the right for girls to, uh, women to, uh, you know, sit like they are, want to wear what they want to, play the sport that they want to, uh, say their mind, speak their mind. And this, uh, we have to remember, it was in 2023 when she started out. Times were different. Uh, India was a different country and, and the spaces didn't really exist for girls and women to, to step out and, and take centre stage like that. Thank you so much for joining us, Siddhant, and taking us to the world of tennis this week. And we'll see you again for this another episode. On January 26, the International Criminal Court said it would resume its investigation into former President Rodrigo Duterte's violent war on drugs. Duterte's war on drugs campaign began in 2016 and has claimed thousands of lives by the government's own account. Some human rights groups put the death toll as high as 12,000. In September 2021, judges at The Hague-based ICC authorized an investigation into the anti-drug campaign, describing it as a widespread and systematic attack against the civilian population. We joined by Anish from People's Dispatch with the latest on this issue. 
Hi Anish, welcome to this episode. So, can you tell us first off, why has the ICC chosen to reopen this investigation at this point of time? And also give us a little bit of recap about what this investigation is about. Yeah, so let's begin with the sort of recap because it's been a while since we actually spoke about it. Uh, in about uh, 2016, uh, shortly, a few couple of months after uh, Rodrigo Duterte came to power as president, uh, the the fr- the ICC prosecutor then uh, had actually suggested the suggested investigating after multiple reports and uh, pleas from uh, rights groups and movements from the Philippines. Now uh, the thing is that uh, before he became president, uh, Duterte uh, was known for his uh, war on drugs uh, when he was a mayor uh, of the Davao city. And at that point in time, there were uh, even he even raised his government at least has been alleged uh, or are facing allegations of having raised uh, a sort of a paramilitary uh, or a uh, militia sort of thing uh, to sort of com- uh, what they call uh, combat uh, drug addiction, which eventually led to uh, hundreds of deaths. It was even called the Davao Death Scots. So we can imagine uh, the kind of uh, impunity that it went about. Uh, in t- uh, after 2016, the policy became a nationwide thing. And so uh, this is precisely what the ICC investigators have been trying to invest, uh, have been trying to look into, uh, primarily because uh, the toll is quite huge uh, for any country to begin with. We are talking about uh, from government official uh, count, which is something about 6,300 or so, to something as high as maybe 27,000 deaths uh, alone. Deaths alone will be uh, that high. You have uh, a massive number of incarcerations that are aside from deaths, many of whom uh, were arrested for uh, being, uh, you know, uh, for using drugs and not even selling or actually being sellers of uh, these illegal drugs. Uh, the, many of them are uh, in under trial, uh, so we do not even know if the veracity of, ch- of the allegations put against them are, uh, you know, are something that uh, the courts would hold water in. Uh, we have also seen the courts also, uh, you know, sort of doing what the government wanted, at least in the in the local uh, judicial administrations. We have seen magistrates just signing off, uh, you know. Uh, mass, what are called as mass warrants, basically where you can actually uh, arrest a large number of people with just uh, as a couple of, you know, a couple of warrants that were signed at the same time uh, with the same kind of application, the same kind of language, the same police officer and, you know, uh, the police station. So these are the kind of things that happen. Uh, and that has often alerted the world, uh, the global community, uh, not just, uh, you know, within the Philippines. Uh, but obviously, uh, the ICC investigation was something that uh, created headlines, obviously. In 2019, we know that uh, Duterte withdrew from the ICC once the investigation seemed like it would happen quite soon. It was at the verge of the of the court sanctioning the investigations to begin with. Um, in 2020, uh, sorry, 2021, uh, the Philippines government at the time, uh, Duterte's government at the time, obviously, uh, had actually uh, filed a petition uh, calling for the uh, the court to hold its investigation uh, until an internal, a domestic investigation of sorts uh, concludes uh, on the basis of what is called as the principle of complementarity, which is basically uh, higher courts not interfering uh, in the jurisdiction of lower courts. So these factors uh, kind of stalled the process uh, because the court was considering whether or not the uh, Filipino judicial system had the capacity or the intentionality to actually prosecute and, uh, you know, charge these officers who are guilty of uh, these killings, uh, you know, and bring them to account, uh, which uh, so far the court and the uh, ICC prosecutor have found to be uh, completely inadequate, uh, even when, even after the government change uh, last year, when uh, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. came to power, obviously, 
uh, his vice president being Sara Dutarte, who again continued her father's legacy as the mayor of Davao City, uh, uh, continued the Davao death squads, and also uh, the anti-drug policy, the violent anti-drug policy of her father in that city, and also advocated for that during her campaign shows that obviously she is also uh, will be part of the investigation or her government at the very least. So which is what the ICC prosecutors are trying to go for. Now, obviously, despite the withdrawal, uh, Philippines still has to abide by the ICC charter or the jurisdiction up until 2019, the day when they withdrew unilaterally from its membership. So despite that, the investigation can happen if the ICC goes ahead with it. Right, Anish. I think there was also a deferral requested by the Embassy of Philippines in Netherlands uh, from the ICC. And we were talking also about the significance of choosing the reopening of this case. So I'll come back to another question. And that will be, do you think that Philippines will take, how will it take to the reopening of this case? Will it allow the investigations of these killings? Well, there has been some kind of, uh, you know, bipolar sort of uh, response coming from the Philippines. At one point, we had the Philippine National Police saying that it will cooperate with the ICC prosecutor just two days ago, uh, very shortly after the ICC court uh, had uh, reopened the investigation. Uh, and on the other hand, we have them saying uh, yesterday that they are not going to, they want uh, the ICC to respect uh, quote unquote national sovereignty and so to allow which is basically them wanting the department of justice to conduct uh, and complete its own investigation uh, which can go in any direction as we know so far uh, in uh, the current circumstances uh, as we see obviously uh, the one thing we need to talk about is that the prosecution does not talk about the Dutartes, be it sara or rodrigo Dutarte, and uh, they are uh, they are not naming names at this point in time because the investigation needs to happen first. So they have they will have to. It is only after that that they will compile a list of uh, defendants that needs to be prosecuted under you know uh, under crimes of uh, crimes against humanity, uh, violation of rights, and so on. So in all of these fact uh, cases, we still have a long process to go if the ICC gets to. Uh, initiate its investigation. It can still con conduct uh, a different and a separate investigation in absentia outside of the Philippines. But obviously, the, uh, this is where we need to talk about where, whether or not the Philippines government uh, will be, uh, you know, uh, cooperative with the court. Because uh, obviously, uh, the Marcos government do not want to, uh, do not want the ICC to investigate or do not want the prosecutors to interfere, or at least what uh, the stated uh, position is that they do not want them to interfere in the judicial process. But uh, they cannot risk, or at least as we have seen so far, the Marcos administration does not want to risk uh, being an international pariah, and it does not want to, uh, you know, be known for violating uh, an international uh, code or convention. So we have to wait and see how uh, it goes through. They have already, as you said. Uh, appealed against the, this reopening. Uh, we'll have to wait and see if that appeal goes anywhere. But once the investigation, it's still a years long process and it can take uh, a longer time to actually uh, even bring uh, any people to, uh, to account. Right. Thank you so much for joining us, Anish, today. And that's all for today's episode. For more such stories, keep following peoplesdispatch.org and also follow our social media handles on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter.